Uh, my name is David Lehrer, and I'm the Executive Director of the Arava Institute for Environmental Studies. Uh, the Arava Institute is an academic research program bringing Jews and Arabs together, Israelis, Palestinians, and Jordanians, in order to teach that nature knows no borders. Nature knows no borders, that's a nice title. Who is funding all this? Um, we're a, a non-governmental organization. Uh, we receive funding from a variety of funders all over the world, USAID, European Union, private foundations. Uh, we have an organization in the United States called the Friends of the Arvai Institute. Individuals are donating <coughs> excuse me, um, some money from the Jewish National Fund uh, in the United States, and some funds come from, um, uh, from some government grants, Israeli government grants. Um, so really a wide Sports variety of, uh, of funding. You said that one of the goals is also to show that uh, actually so-called enemies can peacefully live and study together. Uh, since when are you running this institute and, and what are the results? Do you really specifically work on the issues which usually separate these people? Mm -hmm. um, the, uh, the institute was founded in 1996. Uh, by Professor Alon Tal and Miriam Sharton, who are members of a kibbutz that the institute is located on, uh, Kibbutz Keturah. Um, uh, we've been functioning since 1996. We've had, on average, uh, 50 to 60 students every year. There are over now over 700 uh, students, uh, um, uh, graduates of our program. About half are in the Middle East. Um, and uh, in many ways, I, I like to say that uh, it's important what we do at the Institute, but it's much more important what our students do when they leave the Institute. Um, uh, the, uh, the program is, uh, has a lasting impact. We see this because most of the students who go through the Institute continue to be in contact with each other and with the Institute through our Arava Alumni Peace Environmental Network. It's a, network that was set up by the students themselves after they graduated to in order to keep people in contact to continue to run projects cross-border uh, environmental projects um, and to promote the idea that nature knows no borders and uh, the uh, the program um, as we see has had an impact because we have so many Uh, alumni who are involved and the question is how do, what, how does the program work how do we get to this oh. level where you know um, enemies can be friends um, so when uh, we began the program many years ago we thought we'd throw a bunch of Jews and Arabs in the room teach them about the environment because maybe that's something they can agree on and all the other stuff they would talk about informally in the dining room on the grass you know And what we found is that students could actually live together for a semester or for a year and keep smiling at each other and not say what they really think. Um, or, alternatively, it would come out but in, in a not very constructive way. One of the early uh, parties uh, at the Institute ended with a student smashing a cassette player on the floor over a disagreement about music. Um, so we realized that we couldn't ignore the issues. Um, and eventually we created a, a program that we call the Peace Building and Environmental Leadership Seminar, which okay. is, we call PELS for short. It is a once a week required program for all students, not for credits, not academic, um, and, and it's where we talk about uh, what the students don't want to talk about. So we talk about history, politics, religion, war, occupation, terrorism, all the things that bring up the emotions Uh, um, uh, that, that, that impact us. And it is the Middle East, so these sessions are not very quiet, uh, and they often end with people screaming and yelling at each other and, uh, uh, you know, slamming the door and stomping back to the campus. But what is uh, unique about the RMI Institute is the fact that, um, you know, it's, it's located on a kibbutz, um, in the desert, in the middle of nowhere. So the students basically have no other place to go. They can't run away. They can't run away. And what the students learn is that they can disagree, but they have to get along. Um, this program has really, uh, during the year, 
it's not a lot of fun for the students. Sometimes it is, sometimes it isn't, but the students sometimes complain about the program and often we have to sort of push them to go. But they always tell us at the end of the year that the peace building and environmental leadership seminar was the most important thing that they did. And most of the students we speak to tell us even years later that the Pell's session was a transformational experience for them. That they walked away from the Institute with a different perspective, a different paradigm. And that's really what we're trying to build here is a, is a whole different paradigm. Um, you know, we're often, we often talk about it at the Institute, we talk about resources, natural resources, scarce resources, and of course, uh, people always assume that the scarcest resource in, in the Middle East is water. Um, and I and it is a scarce resource, but I always say it's not the scarcest resource. The scarcest resource is trust. There's no trust. And at the RFI Institute, that's what we do. We build trust. How do you measure? How do you measure if you succeed in that? I mean, that's it's tough. It's a good question. It's not really clear to me if we can measure such a thing. I think trust is something that's you know you can't see, you can't measure. But what I can say is this, is that um, it, I can give some examples. Um, it's almost a given that sometime during the year, something is going to happen. There's going to be a military flare-up. Unfortunately, that's the case. Almost every year we have a military flare-up. And part of how we judge are we successful or are we failing is how well do our students handle it's easy to talk about peace and the all uh, kumbaya, uh, you know, when nothing's going on. But when bombs are falling uh, or people are dying, that's really the test. Um, and in 2008, for example, uh, during the uh, the Gaza War, um, uh, uh, after about a week of missiles falling on Israel, Israel invaded uh, Gaza, and that was on a Saturday morning. Uh, now, it's normally on the weekend, our students are off and they go home. So the Jordanians go back to Oman and the Palestinians go back to Bethlehem or Ramallah or wherever and the Israelis back to Tel Aviv or Jerusalem. So on Sunday morning, which was the second day of the Gaza war, I came to work and I thought to myself, well, I guess this is it. This is the end because the Jordanians are certainly not going to come back across the border. Mm. Palestinians probably won't be allowed back in by the army. And uh, at least half of our Israeli students will be drafted uh, to their units uh, for the call-up. Um, but by the end of the, the day, uh, um, I was proven wrong. And in fact, all of the students came back. The Jordanians came back across the border. We were fortunate that none of our Israeli students were drafted. and. The Palestinians were picked up by our professor, Dr. Tarek Abu Hamid, drove up to Jerusalem in his car and, get and, and get them and drove back four hour trip both ways and brought them back. So by Sunday night, the second night of the war in Gaza, all of the students were back at the institute, but the staff agreed that we couldn't just go back to teaching about, you know, how to protect the lizards and how to share water while 300 kilometers away, Israelis and Palestinians were shooting at each other. So we decided we had to do something, and we brought all of the students together that night in, the, in a room, one in the classroom with some of the staff. There were about 50 people in the room. Mm. We were sitting in a big circle. I was sitting in the middle. And you could have cut the tension with a knife. I can imagine. And I didn't know what I was going to say. I really didn't know what to say. So I just kind of leaned back and I said, does anybody have anything to say? And it was like I'd opened up the dam. The Palestinians jumped up and started screaming at the Israelis, pointing their finger. You're committing a holocaust on our people. And the Israelis jumped up and started screaming back. Where were you last week when the bombs were falling on the Jewish settlement of Sterot? Well, there was lots of yelling and screaming. But by the end, there was lots of hugging and kissing and tears in their eyes. And mm -hmm. uh, at the end, the students all got together and decided that the next day, they would hold a vigil uh, for peace, calling for peace in, in, in the region. In a way, I expected that outcome. Um, I assumed that they would find a way to, to come together. But what is really surprising, what is really exceptional about the Arabi Institute is the fact that on the second night of the war in Gaza, there was one place in the entire Middle East in which Palestinians and Israelis were in the same room screaming at each other. 
They weren't shooting at each other. They weren't firing missiles at each other. They weren't even throwing rocks at each other. They were using probably their words. A proper security check before they entered the space. <laughs> we trust our students. <laughs> and they trust each other. And that's really what the what this uh, program enables and, them to do. Yeah. You can't, that couldn't happen unless they trust each it's other. It's tough. I can imagine. I, so since the unrests around Israel, has this problem of gaining trust changed? Since the Arabi Institute has been established, there's been ongoing violence uh, all along. Um, I became the executive director of the Arabi Institute in 2001. That was a year after the uh, uh, second Intifada, yeah. Intifada Al-Aqsa. Yeah. Um, you know, there's always there's always violence. There's always yeah. conflict. Um, you know, is it getting easier? Is it getting harder? I'm not sure. I think people are getting frustrated. I think people have some expectation that things should get better with time, yeah. and uh, it doesn't feel so much like that's happening. But at least our students have hope. Our students have faith. Um, because what we're able to do, many other Israelis and Palestinians, Jordanians are not able to do. And that's meet each other. That's know who we are. Um, the Middle East in the past 20 years has become a very, very segregated place with lots of walls, both physical and non-physical, making it impossible to so, meet. Yeah. And when you can't meet, then you come up with all kinds of ideas about the other. Right. I mean, those people or those students from Amala, they must have a special permission to go there, right? They need to get permission from the Israeli army. Yeah. And the Jordanians, yes, of course, also well. need uh, So visas. is this a tricky thing? For it's them? not simple. It's not simple. In fact, one of our staff members, Judy uh, Barlev, uh, basically half of her time is spent getting permits for uh, Palestinians and visas for Jordanians. So we do spend, uh, invest a lot of time mm. in that. Mm, and it's also, I mean, a way to go for them if they go back and forth or... Um, no, well, it's, it's, a, it's a tiny, tiny little, a tiny I mean, little it's thing. It's tiny, but still, I mean, five, six, seven hours are easily spent, yeah. especially crossing the border. True, true. <laughs> they don't go every weekend, yeah. you know. Yeah. So, in your personal opinion, uh, what do you think, how has the situation of Israel changed within all this in Arab Spring? Uh, the and, Arab Spring? Yeah. How does it influence Israel? Um, I, I think it's, it's really hard for me to say. Um, there just is a lot more uncertainty. I guess that's the biggest issue for Israel. You know, when, when Mubarak is in power, so you know who's in power, you know what his strengths and weaknesses are. When Assad is in power, I mean, think about Assad and, and, and uh, um, you know, how, how, uh, what a dictator both he and his father were. And yet, mm -hmm. since 1973 until today, there has not been any incidents, cross-border incidents until Reason. until recently. All those years that there was a terrible dictator in power in Syria, there there was quiet. Now that things are, you know, up, it's hard. It's hard. So I, I think that that's a big concern for Israelis, uh, mm -hmm. the the instability uh, of the region, not knowing what's going to happen in Egypt, not knowing what's going to happen in uh, in Syria. And I think it goes to the, in my opinion, it goes to the short sightedness of the most recent Israeli governments, um, because. Clearly, our strategic situation would be so much better off right now had we come to an agreement with the Palestinians a while ago. And the fact that Egypt and Syria, which could be very big threats to Israel, uh, as well as to Jordan, are in flux, and we still are dealing with the conflict between the, the Palestinians and Israel. And certainly that's one of the reasons, one of the main motivations, I'm sure, why the United States has been pushing all of a sudden, been pushing very hard for Israel to go back into negotiations because the United States understands how critical it is for the stability of the region that the Israeli-Palestinian conflict be resolved. Hopefully they do understand. I do have my doubts, but Well, I have my doubts for the first four years, but uh, I think that the penny dropped now, maybe a little late. Uh, I don't know what Obama was doing for the first four years, but he certainly 
didn't have his eye on the ball when he came to the Middle East, and he just you know let let things go. Things go. And, and uh, I think there are serious consequences to that. Hopefully, you know this initiative now is going is going is serious enough that it's actually going to make a difference. Mm. And how this would be also my last question: How are you related to the Melton Foundation, and what was your biggest takeaway today? Well, first of all, <laughs> this is really my first contact with the Melton Foundation. We were invited to be speakers here. That's really the contact. Um, though I do think that there's a lot of uh, uh, there's really a lot of parallels between the work that we do at the RMI Institute and the work that the Global uh, uh, Citizenship Program of the Melton Foundation is doing. In many ways, I see my our alumni as very much in the same sort of mindset as the young people I've met here. Um, so it was pretty phenomenal. I mean, you know, I heard some in incredibly inspiring uh, people, and I would love to have them come to the RFI Institute and meet our students. Um, I would like to have our students somehow involved in this uh, global citizenship uh, program of the Milton mm -hmm. Foundation. Do you yourself go to Palestine and to Amman and? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm in, in and out all the time. On the programs or? Um, meeting students, colleagues. Uh, I didn't really mention one of the other aspects of the Institute is our research. We do uh, research in four areas, renewable energy, sustainable agriculture, transboundary water management, and binational uh, nature conservation. So um, we actually uh, have lots of colleagues in both Jordan and in Palestine and have meetings, uh, you know, uh, quite often we have um, the Institute is a, really is a center for a lot of international conferences specifically between Jordan Palestine and Israel for instance in December we held a, a conference on um, uh, uh, renewable energy and uh, transboundary water management uh, on, on solutions for um, off-the-grid uh, um, uh, communities Uh, and uh, we had about 75 uh, is, uh, Israeli, Palestinian, and Jordanian uh, um, guests, uh, including three Palestinians from Gaza. This was in December, about two weeks after the last mm -hmm. flare-up, but yet we had three Palestinians from Gaza from the Palestinian Water Authority who came. Uh, so there's a lot of communication, despite what you see in the news. It's not all that. It's not all... You know, uh, hate. There's actually a lot of cooperation going on, low key, uh, um, because people understand that nature knows no borders. They understand that if you want to solve the environmental issues in the region, you have to work together.